Hello and welcome to another episode of Lockdown Dads. I'm James Miller, editor of workingdads.co.uk, author of Dads Don't Babysit and father of two children. And I am joined as ever by... Ian Dinwiddie, I am the founder of Inspiring Dads, a coaching business that helps stress dads to balance work and fatherhood. I've got two children as well, two different children, which is usually James's line, um, and they're, they're 11 and 8. Uh, and this week, we're, we're really pleased to be joined with a new guest, um, Jamie Beaglehole, who is one half of Daddy and Dad. He is a parent and a blogger. Uh, welcome to the show, Jamie. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're really well. Great to have you here. Um, we'll start off with the first question that we, we ask all our guests. And, you know, we hope for a degree of honesty and uh, appreciating, you know, the importance of mental health and, and being honest about our circumstances. We're a big part of the show. So, Jamie, how are you at the moment? So, I guess if there was like a scale of one to ten, right, where one is like really horrendous and ten is like amazing on a holiday, I'm probably about six, maybe. So like not actually doing too badly, um, although I guess you're asking me at the back end of half term, where I've been working full time with the children here, uh, more than usual because there's no school on their computers upstairs. <laughs> so I, I'm in a kind of state of permanent disruption at the moment. Uh, but yeah, generally throughout this third lockdown, I'm coping not too badly. Well, that said, we've actually decided recently that we will sell our house and move and so we are adding the stress of buying and selling a house to the mix as well uh, as working full-time and having the kids running around with us at home so i mean that, that's added a new level of kind of confusion and stress but um but not, not doing too badly i'm yeah. quite level-headed really Appreciate that six while you've got it in that case. If you're going to start moving house, that'll take a couple of points off your, off your score. <laughs> oh, man. Well, they already we've had a buyer pull out. And then, I mean, because it's the whole, the whole house buying thing at the moment is so volatile. Nobody, nobody can uh, commit. And so we've lost a buyer. Then we put the house back on sale last week and we got a new buyer like within a day or two. And then it turned out their chain was too complicated. But right, it's all really, really complex. At the moment, how it is, is we've bought a new house and we've got a buyer, but they've literally only just had their offer accepted so, so basically that that side of things is a little bit stressful um in addition to half term and work but not too bad <laughs> yeah you don't seem that stressed i mean you you seem yeah like you say you're quite relaxed you seem like a quite a relaxed guy about it which is which is good i think a lot of people would be um afraid but maybe it's because of friday afternoon i mean i i always have this on a friday afternoon and when we when we record so james how, yeah. how are you how are you at the end of half term yeah, half term, good point. It's been a rainy half term. That's been the problem, hasn't it? It's not just half term. It's been a rainy half term. And the weathermen, frankly, I mean, I could, I could come up with some quite strong sanctions that I think should be carried out against weathermen. But at the very least, they, they should be very strictly told off for being rubbish. Because they told us at the weekend it was going to be probably all right most of the week. And I was like, right, okay, let's make, you know, all we can do is go for flipping walks. So it's like, right, let's plan some walks this is what we're going to do. And then Monday, the weatherman turns around and goes, yeah, actually, I fooled you. It's going to rain all week. Ah, you're going to have to do stuff staying indoors. Weathermen. Uh, Government should be thinking. So that wasn't very helpful, yeah. uh, I would say. But, um, yeah, you know, I think, you know, nobody's doing better than a six at the moment, are they? Let's face it. Is there anybody in, in lockdown three going, yeah, I feel like an eight or a nine. This is amazing. Uh, <laughs> in millionaires aside, I guess most people are about average, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> is about as good as you can hope for um yeah it's been all right it's been up and down i mean we had we had the old saga of boris the cat the coat a few weeks ago well kiwi the cat's down at the vets just now um you know i think there's something to be said about pets and how actually helpful they've been in lockdown but then when they go wrong it becomes a much bigger stress than <laughs> it might otherwise be in lockdown you realize uh so you know it, yeah hanging together it, it the weird thing about it at the moment, particularly with, with mental health, I think, is waiting for this goddamn speech from Boris on Monday. Mm. And then we know what we're dealing with. And we know if the kids are going back at school. We know roughly what the timetable is. I mean, we don't really because the government is a bunch of clowns and they'll, you know, whatever they say will only last a couple of days and they'll not be revised. But that I find actually quite difficult with that waiting to then be, we're going to be doing more waiting from Monday, but we're waiting for Monday to then find out what we're, how long we're going to have to wait after that. And that I think is quite I think that's quite, I mean, genuinely quite difficult for everyone. Just that, you know. Do you, do you, find, do you find yourself actually watching the Boris updates? Because I don't watch them, you see. 
Not anymore, but I mean, I will on Monday. I mean, I will be really it's a big one. see what, what we're getting there. And I think that is a mental health thing because, you know, it's control, isn't it? It's out of our control. And yeah. not only that, it's in the control of a man who is a clown. And that's quite annoying. But uh, <laughs> that's you know, my personal opinion. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that, that I, I do genuinely think that's quite a, a mental health challenge for everyone, particularly yeah. parents who are waiting to see if the kids are going to go back to school. But, you know, that's quite a long way of saying, yeah, basically same as Jamie Six. <laughs> see, usually when you ask it, from a coaching perspective, when you ask these things, people usually plunk on seven. So I think one below one below the magic seven, which everyone chooses, is um, is perfect. Well, um, Ian, how are you? Are yeah, you for a me, am I a seven? Ah, maybe six and a half. I go six and a half. There you go. That's controversial. Yeah. Um, I channeled my inner, we're talking about Boris Johnson. I channeled my inner Tory MP and I booked a holiday or at least accommodation uh, last weekend, which I, I'm not sure I'm allowed to do, but it's August and it's, it's in Devon. It's not by the seaside. I mean, it's not the busiest area of Devon. So, you know, Devon people, and I'm from Somerset. So, you know, I'm allowed to go to Devon, I think. Yeah, you'll be fine. Um, I'll be fine in August. But, you know, it, w a lot of the mood music was don't, you know, don't book anything. But um, with the way the prices were going up and the availability was going down, then we got in there and just that little ray of hope. It's like August. We're going to be, we can walk on Dartmoor. We can go up to Torquay. We can go to the beaches. Nice. We'll look on whatever. You know, great. So that, that was a really big part of it. Big, big plus. Um, I had a blink and you miss it cameo on TV on Monday night, which was quite fun. Nice. On Emma Willis delivering uh, babies 2020. Um, my brother nice. and his wife were the stars, pretty much. They were all doing their their performancey things. And I was in the background as as um as a dad who can look after children who aren't his own, which um I wrote a little blog post about it because I think it's quite important for men to learn the skills to be able to look after children. And I was able to use that skill to look after my two-year-old niece. Um so a big part of helping them with their, their birth story last summer. So, yeah, six and a half, maybe a seven. Yeah, I'm all right, actually. It's good. I mean, it's a Friday. I might, I might upgrade to six and a half because you just reminded me of your sister-in-law's Valentine Instagram post. So that's probably, <laughs> worth, that's, probably worth, that's probably worth an extra half a post. I mean, I felt a bit weird looking at it because she's your sister-in-law. But at the same time, you know... Uh, <laughs> What have I missed? Uh, <laughs> you know, look her up. I mean, she's work, it's, uh, it's quite a thing. Ta her so Instagram. If, you want, if you want to look up my sister-in-law, she's tacky seven and she dances. I'm not sure she'll have the same. I'm not sure she's worth half a point to you, Jamie, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> she's um, my sister-in-law. <laughs> anyway, yeah, meeting yeah, swiftly on. It's definitely not worth half a point to you. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about the path. The path, that's what the next feature is supposed to be about, is, is where we actually get to talk to Jamie. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. Where, where should we start? Let, let's start at the beginning. Uh, you know, you are, I mean, you are a daddy blogger. I don't know if you, how you feel about that, that term. Yeah. Um, you know, well, just tell us the path. How did it fit? Did you always want to be a dad and then had to think about how, how that was going to happen? Or did you always want to be a blogger and then the dad bit came second? How did, tell us how you got to, to be where you are. Well, in terms of like our path to becoming parents, because of course we're two dads, we're two, two men, so our, our sort of options for uh, starting a family are, are slightly different to other couples. So after we've been together for a decade or so, we met when we were 21, and I'm 40 now. Um, so when we were about 30, we decided to start a family and we did loads of research and looked at surrogacy and we... Uh, looked for examples of other same-sex couples with kids and how they had children. There wasn't really that many, to be honest, to, to, uh, to, look, to look at. But um, the adoption for us stood out as an opportunity because we wanted two children. Um, and also, when we did a little bit of research about adoption, we, we, we found out all about the sheer volume of uh, sibling groups in care that they can't place with people and they get separated and adopted separately, which is really heartbreaking. So we thought, right, we'll go for two kids at once rather than staggering it and going the ordinary way. Um, so we basically, uh, I won't go into too much detail about the adoption process, but it's quite a huge, um, convoluted, enormous, overwhelming process that you go through for a couple of years. And then at the end of it, you sort of become a family overnight, literally, um, which we did with our kids. So our kids moved in in 2014 and they were four and five, Lionel Mitch, and they're very cute. 
And basically, during the adoption process, when we were looking for real life examples of a same sex family or even a family with adopted kids, there wasn't anything real to look at. Um, and at the time, I was a digital marketing manager, so I had experience in managing these corporate blogs for various brands. So I had that kind of knowledge on how to set a blog up and how to write one. Um, and I, I thought maybe I'd write a book or maybe we'll do some kind of video vlog or something. But blogging was really my kind of, uh, was my expertise. So I set up the blog to basically plug the gap in that we found in information about real life adopted families. Um, so, I, so we literally launched the blog a couple of months after the kids moved in. And we called it Daddy and Dad because that's what the kids called us. Um, we wanted to call it Dad and Daddy. We had a bit of an argument about it because Tom wanted to be Dad first. But that, that wasn't a unique name, unfortunately, so it had to be Daddy and Dad. <laughs> That's convenient. Who set it up? Was it you that set it up? Oh, it was me that set it up. Oh, it was me that set it up. Oh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> how much of it was, was coming from, from you guys as well in the sense that, you know, as you say, you're, you're filling a gap and you're trying to sort of do a, a public service to some extent, but was there also an element of, you know, working through the process... You know, yeah, it, you think about what's going on because coming a parent in any circumstance is mad, frankly. I mean, so there's, there's yes. a amount of you know that working out in your head, and, and I suspect blogging helps with that. It was therapeutic because I was writing like creative writing in the evenings with us line basically after the kids went to bed. So that was a it was a real outlet for me because the process as well, particularly after the kids move in, you do. As an adopted parent, you do feel like you've just been plopped in the deep end, basically, with kids with baggage and all these issues that you need to try and uh, work through. And uh, so I was writing really from the heart and just really realistically, all the sort of blood and guts and gore and nosebleeds and stuff, as well as all the um, routine and parental stuff. Because uh, I was in no way like any kind of parental parent expert either. So I was really trying to lay out exactly how it was feeling and how lost we felt sometimes which people really identified with and to be honest I never really expected it to grow quite as quickly as it did but I guess because it was quite unique um, and because it was quite realistic and also because it was about adoption so adoption agencies picked it up as a resource for potential yeah. adopters to read um, it grew really quickly so I really had to um, put quite a lot of effort and focus on it um, and then I was made redundant. So I went back part time after uh, the kids arrived, after about six or seven months of their sort of settling in period. I went back to work part time. And being a part time digital marketing manager doesn't really work very well because there's a full time amount of work to do um, and not an enormous budget. So I, and basically it wasn't going to work. So I was made redundant, which was, and it was cliched. And everyone said it would be, but it was the best thing uh, for me career-wise because I just applied all that extra time on the blog and and it grew and grew and started to win awards and, um, and really became quite a big part of our lives as well. And I spent literally the amount of time I was previously working full-time writing blog and taking photographs and contacting brands and stuff like that. I mean, I suspect it also did very well because, I mean, you say it's about adoption, but it's also, uh, as I say, in parenthood in any way is just weird and mad. And there is a certain, you know, whether you're adopting or however you become a parent, there are, there are certain themes that always carry through. I mean, I, I remember of we've got friends who, uh, again, same-sex partners who adopted. Uh, he came around before they were going to collect their child and sort of wanted to know how do you parent? And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sat all afternoon not really, not really explaining it just sort of talking about it you know because we're no experts and he I remember he said you know he collected this little boy and you know you you collect I don't know how it was for you but collected him from a foster family uh in the Midlands sort of thing and, and they're told don't look back you know don't look back you put the kid in the car and you drive away and you drive away to your new life and I remember we were like that, that sounds really weird and then it was like how did I become a dad? Well, that's right. This baby fell out of my wife's fanny. I mean, that is way <laughs> weirder. That is a million times weirder than putting a kid in a car. I mean, that is just, <laughs> you know, just becoming a parent in any way is weird and mad. And as I say, I mean, I think, you know, your blog is, you know, whether you're adopting or, or same sex or whatever, 
Uh, there's certain themes that I think everybody can recognize. I think that's probably why it's, you know, the secret. Yeah. Like and also, after doing a bit of research, I say research, after basically noticing what was working and what wasn't working on blog, um, I realized that the really realistic, a little bit snobby stuff where I would use a setting like a soft play, basically, as the backdrop for a parenting situation, people really loved it. Um, so in the early days, I would literally go to horrendous trampoline parks and sit in the cafe and write while the kids were like bashing around and stuff. And um, and there was always hilarious little anecdotes from the people that were around me, um, you know, and like people with kids having tantrums around me and stuff. So um, I used to just really write very realistically and not shying away from these awful situations that parents find themselves in. And I am a bit snobby as well. So like, and I don't particularly like people that are really noisy. So holidays to Butlins, for instance, and things like that just used to provide us with so much um, content for the blog. Um, because I'd sit there at 11 a.m. typing away on my laptop and there'd be some great big tattoo guy next to me drinking beer at 11 a.m. with his kids screaming around naked or wearing like kind of hideous, um, angry birds jumpers and stuff. And so I used to just write all about that and people used to really love it. But then as I've become more of a kind of established parent, I realised actually I've probably become a little bit like the people that I used to take the piss out of. I just wasn't actually used to it. And all these people had already been parents for four or five years, whereas I'd only just become one suddenly with a four-year-old. So basically it, the blog gradually became a little bit more um, serious, I guess. Um, and as we, uh, as we like encountered issues with the kids, because all adopted kids, unlike birth kids, ha had this trauma with them, you know, from um, previous lives. And um, so, so that's been something we've looked at a lot. But then thinking about in the past to where I am now, I guess after the blog became award winning and really started attracting attention to sponsors and stuff, um, I left kind of the adoption content behind a little bit to sit there because it was it was already kind of established and getting a lot of readers over and over again anyway, and concentrated a little bit more on things like travel and commercial stuff like technology and family review, with technology reviews and movies and days out and uh, holidays. Fun stuff. Yeah, basically. And yeah. Uh, basically that then became much more of a kind of lifestyle type uh, blog, which was a lot more, had a much broader appeal as well, which was good. So basically we started to appeal to generally more parents rather than a little bit of more of a niche LGBT adoption type thing. So, um, and, and then that then, um, eventually, basically I was uploading way too much media on the website and it was slowing it down. So somebody mentioned to me that we should start an Instagram, basically as a little spin-off to get our pictures on a, a different channel that can cope with it all a bit better. Um, and Instagram, to me, was at the time something that my sister used to put pictures of cats on that all looked like vintage photos. And I thought, oh, God, do I really want to get into that with filters and stuff? Um, and it literally grew so fast. To I'm going to put a couple of pictures up, and we had about 8,000 followers already. And then um, and that, that kept growing and growing and growing. We've had it for about three or four years now. Um, but Instagram eventually became my full-time job. Uh, now, the, so the blog basically is a little bit more of a hobby now, um, but still, I'm still extremely proud of it, and it still has lots of visitors, but the Instagram job, I call myself an influencer now, but that still doesn't sit like, I don't feel like one, but I call myself an influencer because basically we work, and we're really, really busy working with brands, on product placement and uh, lifestyle content that's sponsored. So we basically earn a fee for working with brands to host sponsored content. But the way we do it uh, is that we try and make it sort of fit in with our everyday life and everyday content so that Instagram doesn't look like a huge eyebrows catalog. It kind of um, sits. So basically, we just slip little fit it, the odd, odd product in with our general going about our lives as a family with two dads. Uh, which is which works really well so that that really has become quite a huge full-time paid job for me now 
Um, and, you know, it doesn't show any sign of getting of quieting down either. And it's really interesting, Jamie, um, sort of hearing your story about how looking back, it seems inevitable you'd end up in this this path. It starts with blogging, it goes into something and using your digital media manager background. But one, I mean, one of the things James and I talk about a lot is about sort of we talk about gender equality and in terms of men and women and how they divide up in heterosexual relationships, how they divide up what they do in the home and who looks after children. And I wonder what kind of conversation, you know, pre obviously you were made redundant at a time that sounds pretty convenient. But what kind of conversations did you and Tom have about how you're going to split childcare and, and what sort of and how did that work for you guys? Well, when we first adopted the kids, the our relationship dynamic completely changed overnight because I was uh, off work looking after the kids full time, doing a school run for Lyle and looking after Richard because he was delayed developmentally. So he took quite a lot of intensive sort of uh, looking after and training sort of thing as a, with me. Tom was straight back into working full time and he's got quite a big corporate job. He's a, um, how, what was he? He's a director of a tech firm in down in Cambridge. Uh, so, uh, so he's um, got, got a big, stressful full-time job. And uh, his job as well has just continued to uh, grow and grow over the last seven years with the kids here. Um, so, which actually meant that the, when I, after I was made redundant, the fact I was working from home all the time was really convenient because I could do all the school runs basically work during school hours and then in the afternoon there was quite there was an element of sort of booting the kids out onto the village green every evening to get a few more hours in um but i was able to work from home but that hasn't been a, a basically it hasn't been an easy thing for tom and i to cope with as a relation as a couple um the fact that particularly when work in the early days was quite quiet and it was kind of like pocket money um the the, the kind of imbalance financially and in kind of our relationship with the kids and all sorts was just so enormously sort of off skew. But saying that, as my job's become more and more um, stable and, and it's grown, our kind of, we, we've balanced out a little bit now. So even though Tom's still doing quite a big full-time stressful job, um, we do feel a little bit more equal, which kind of is nice. And also, in lockdown, like the last whole year, Tom's been working from home as well. So we have been able to share stuff that I used to do all myself. Um, but yeah, it's hard for parents, isn't it, when one person is sort of doing all the work and one, the other person doing all the childcare, because one or the other, or both, always feels a little bit like the kind of lazy one, even though they're not, where the other one feels like they're completely run off their feet. And that can kind of go either way, can it? You know, the person doing all the sort of primary caring can often feel quite undervalued, and but on the same time, they're kind of cleaning up sick and running around and doing all the housework and everything. And meanwhile, the other parent can likewise feel like they're doing all the work and supporting everyone. Yeah, providing, yeah, yeah. Kind of it's hard, and Tom and I haven't, we've never really got, we've never really found a result for it. And I don't think we will until we retire. <laughs> I am, imagine retiring I know my mum and dad retired last year I'm well jealous of them <laughs> never gonna, we're, not, we're the generation that's never going to retire let's face it oh no don't say that my, my wife's but, yeah, so, an alpaca farm that's what she wants well that does sound quite nice though doesn't it I mean <laughs> I'd be more interested in the actual farm element rather than the alpacas but okay, yeah. it'd be nice to live in the countryside yeah. <laughs> it's crazy no, it's like, no, not at all. Um, but, uh, I mean, Jamie, you talked about, um, it's Lyle and Rich, isn't it? Your, your, your two boys. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. You, you yeah. talked about, yes. and you talk about adoption and, and sort of, you know, adopted kids have a backstory uh, and, and trauma involved in that. I wonder whether you've got any special sort of support as an adoptive parent to help you to support them in sort of, yeah, becoming part of your family, in, in particular with those challenges? Mm, the unfortunate answer really is no. Tom and I really had to wing it, work and work really hard ourselves and do a lot of research. 
But during, during the last stages of the adoption process, uh, our social worker, who was amazing, she was called Michelle, um, she would help us with um, prepare it, preparing basically for how we might parent and, and how we might deal, cope with various issues that might crop up. Because we knew generally all about the kids' backstory and where they came from and what kind of issues they might have experienced. But the difference, the difficulty is though with kids is that not everything is diagnosed. So like you can't, you can't really prepare for everything. Um, and then after adoption, like anecdotally, there are places you can get support from, but you never really feel like you're not able to cope yourselves. I don't know. It's a funny thing. Cause like we probably could in hindsight have done with some extra support back then. Um, but we just thought we could probably cope with it ourselves, which we did actually in the end, but it was really, really hard work. Mm. Um, you know, speech therapy. We did everything in house basically. And I, I guess that's where the blog comes in, is helping other people in the same boat. So they're not quite so on their own, that they, there's a lot of resources that you've provided and a lot of experience that you can share. Yeah, I feel that another thing that I've mentioned on other uh, interviews like this is that I don't think dads get the same level of support as mums anyway, because like in the early days when we when we first became dads and I was doing, like dropping Lyle off to school and I was left with Richard for the day, there were all these different mums groups for kind of mums and babies and the library and all these different other things like Pilates, kids and yoga, everyone, so many different things. And, um, but none of them applied to me at all with a four-year-old boy as a dad. Mm. And um, so, you know, I, I do wonder sometimes whether there's enough provision for dads generally, adopted, gay, whatever, just dads. I don't necessarily think there's enough um, support there uh, but I think actually things the, the the situation for adopted parents has improved now. There is more there is more help available um, nowadays than there was seven or eight years ago when we adopted. Mm. Certainly, and I know that because I know young adopted parents now that are, that are going to groups and having therapy and all sorts of different things. Yeah, it's a it's a I don't know it's a sort of tricky one. I'm not sure it's that as tricky as some people think it is. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking of the blog post you posted last year about going to the pub. Uh, and you know the managers like where well, you, you you're two families obviously so you've got to fill in the different NHS. Oh groups. yeah. No, actually, we're one family. And it's like I mean you know uh, there's a pandemic on. I had a certain amount of sympathy with the bar manager I have to say because you know, there's a pandemic on. But at the same time, as I say, it's not that complicated. You know, uh, like you say, you just need to apologise on that one. I think was was fairly straightforward. Look up the blog to oh, yeah. what I'm talking about. But it's just those what we might call microaggressions or whatever. It's just that idea that the world is not quite set up for the food, you know, it's set up for one model of family, isn't it? Let's face it at the end of the day. Um, Absolutely. To, and, to, um, to, to accommodate everybody. You know? It doesn't take long for me to think of several examples, mm. you know, where we've been made to feel completely different to everybody else in a room, just yeah. because the uh, setup of our family is ever so slightly different to another one. But yeah. that was a classic example, basically, where a barman didn't believe that we were one family and so wouldn't allow us into a pub without an argument during lockdown when you were not allowed to mix. I mean, it was yeah. stupid, basically, and it just needed a little smile or an apology or something. But we do, we, there's always situations like that, you know, as well when, and this again applies to all dads, just changing facilities and stuff for young children and rubbish for men. And like, of course, when you're two dads, there isn't any option, is there? <laughs> so, that, uh, you know. Think, that's kind of the point, isn't it? Is that it's not so much that the world is, you know, the world is set out for a certain model of parenthood. And there's always a sort of implication that, all right, there's not enough changing facilities for dads. So what, it, you know, in, in case of emergency, mum can go and do it. But of course, if there's not a mum, for whatever reason, She's then, at work. Yeah. You know, in my it, case, it used to mean she was at work. I was just like, yeah. I'm coming in ladies, I've got a child got a baby this is where the changing is and they were like oh yeah sure no problem yeah I was quite I guess so. and I guess it's the same with you that as a sort of parent as a hands-on parent life is just so complicated and busy anyway those little problems like that just feel really really insignificant that particular pub thing really got on my tits so I had to write it down but like I wouldn't bother 
telling anyone about all the other things that happened. Yeah. Just because, like, I, I will five minutes later have been like separating the boys apart because they're about to headbutt each other, or something like parenting has happened that's way more important. Or you know, one of them's crossed a road without looking, or whatever it is. But um, yeah, you know, like most of the issues we experience are exactly the same as everybody else. But I do think as two dads or two mums, probably, um, there are so many little things that businesses and places can do to maybe feel a little bit more included, but they just don't bother. Valentine's Day is a big example where everything's complete. I mean, there's no more of a reminder that you're kind of a guest in straight world than all the crap you see around Valentine's Day every single year. I mean, Tom and I have completely given up celebrating it pretty much now because... Um, because you pay over the odds for a crappy meal in a restaurant yeah. and then you're just surrounded by all these straight people holding hands you know and it's just yeah. with all these pink flowers everywhere yeah. <laughs> and I just think Great. you know there's all the, and Mother's Day as well it can be a bit insensitive at school but all these different issues though feel so insignificant when you're living a life that's so complicated and busy already yeah but they all add up don't they I think that's the thing I mean, I they think do the yeah is that you know um businesses people in general uh you know be aware and go that extra step and that almost sounds like a tip which is how we try and end this podcast and i'm looking at that <laughs> i'm looking at that little clock thinking these are gonna have to be some very quick tips this week so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh wheel out my tip very quickly uh it is uh i'm holding it up it is uh martin robinson guest on the podcast in december his book is out it is you are not the man you're supposed to be i haven't read it yet I looked for the index. There isn't an index. I don't think I'm in it. So, you know, that's a bit annoying. Who's um, it by again? It's by Martin Robinson. He runs the Book of Man website. It's all about sort of new masculinity. Yes, yeah, yeah I've heard of him. I'm recommending it because he came on the podcast. I don't know if it's any good because I haven't read it yet, but I shall report back next week. That is my quick tip uh, for this week. Who's next? Yeah, and because when you become an adopted parent, you get this kind of opportunity the other parents don't get and that you've got this kind of like fresh slate and you can start again with the kids. Um, we, we, what we found is to get the bedtime routine going, we had the kids choose themselves an alarm clock to go into their beds, which was like their most proud thing they'd ever bought. And ever since that first day when they put their alarm clocks on their bedside table, they've been to bed and get got up at the right time. We've never, never had a single bedtime problem. And I think more parents should probably do something like that that in, involves the kids in a decision to make the routine a little bit more stable. Yeah, top tip, top tip. Um, I like that one a lot. Um, my very quick one, The Morning Show. I've got really into it. Hard to find. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. But Reese Witherspoon and uh, Jennifer Aniston, uh, and they are news presenters. It's a kind of post-Me Too um, look at um, sexual politics in the workplace and, and gender equality. And it's really funny as well. So uh, The Morning Show. That's my tip. Ooh, so, write that down. Jamie, to, to wrap up while you're writing that down, um, where can people uh, go to find you on Instagram and, and the blog? Yes, so if you Google Daddy and Dad, all our links to all our various channels come up, but our main one is the blog, and it is www.daddyanddad, as in D-A-D-D-Y-A-N-D-D-A-D.co.uk. Um, and from there, we've got all various links to Instagram, YouTube, and uh, everywhere else. And um, we'd, uh, we'd love to have you on board and we'd love to hear your feedback and comments and things. Jamie, thank you very much for being here today on <laughs> episode number 34 of Lockdown Dads. Um, it's been, been really, really interesting to hear uh, stories that we haven't explored before on this blog in terms of adoption and same-sex couples. So thank you very much for being here and sharing your story. It's been really, really interesting. Um, and everyone, um, for those of you uh, watching or listening, please do give it a like and a share. And we will see you all next week for another episode of Lockdown Dads. Thank you, Jamie, for being with us. Thank you. Bye-bye.